uh, but it just doesn't send them to any of the they never get they never get consumed by any of the systems not the command dispatcher or anybody else which is kind of odd um, uh, and it suggests maybe there's a bug in how the inputs being handled uh, which could be that the command maps get set incorrectly for some reason so I set up here on the top bar that GUI file thing that just threw me for a loop and then I was wondering since it's so small can you guys even read this stuff on my screen stream died. Are you talking about when I stopped and started the stream? That wasn't the stream dying. That was because I, I stop and start the stream as a matter of as, as, a, as a method of sectioning the video up so I can export it to YouTube easily. Oh man, so you guys really did lose it. Alright. <sighs> okay, so Let's try that again. I wonder if the export to YouTube is also going to be messed up then, or what will happen. My question was, uh, this here, this little um, text at the top, I explained why the text threw me for a loop because I noticed it and it surprised me. But let's suppose that, that I don't care about telling you that story again. Can you read the text on the screen? Because I just noticed that a long time ago I made it smaller, and I'm sure you can maybe roughly read some of this, but I don't know how well it actually translates into these videos that I make. I'd like to make them actually readable. Okay, Mibble can read it. Yeah, because I was just asking if you could read GUI and file up here because I added those earlier today to debug an issue and I had explained what the issue was. But we're going to skip the explanation because it's completely irrelevant and not important. Okay, so what we are doing today is I just got the Lexer released. And the reason I did that was because I was cleaning it up anyway, uh, getting it fit into the whole, the big documentation that I ship, and I want to um, include it with all the other four coder files that I send out to backers of the cus of the um, super level and the reason I'm doing that is because I'm going to expose the four coder tokens and so I needed the lexer types anyway and I figured why don't I go ahead and make a first release of the whole lexer um, or not the whole lexer but the main the main the, the main lexer the relexer the API is not quite ready yet um, but now that that's done, it's time to actually do what I was going to do originally, which is put the tokens into the API. So to do that, what I have to do, I'm explaining my task to you here so that we'll be on the same page, is here in implementation, I need to write this function buffer auto indent. I'm going to eliminate this function, or at least deprecate it. But um, by deprecate it, I just mean uh, it. I'm gonna remove it because this is alpha still and I don't mind making everyone change everything all the time. <sighs> I should start I should start introducing wrappers for all of these functions. I'll do that in 4.1. I'll introduce wrappers for all of these so that I can make them stay correct as long as possible. But for now I'm gonna break the next version by deleting auto buffer auto indent and instead implementing it on the custom side. Um, but to do that, I need to figure out what the API needs to be for actually reading the tokens, right? So, um, the first thing I'm going to do is write a sort of example usage by coming over here to auto indent, and I'm basically going to re-implement this function in rough terms and figure out what API I want for reading tokens. And by the way, I feel like I'm lower than I like to be. Okay, that might be a little better. Yeah. Okay, so um, first, let me finish copying over all of this. I want to make sure it auto indent flags. I want to make sure it all makes sense to copy over. It looks like it does. Okay. 
and I don't need to keep that all on one line anymore. In this file, my metaprogramming skills were they were still noobish when I first started using the metaprogramming system, and so the very first metaprogram I did parsed these function signatures here, and so they all had to be on one they had to be on one whole long line, which is obviously bad. Um, I could go fix that sometime, but it's not important yet. <sighs> yes, Miblo says my Miblo, my yes, my Miblo programming, my meta programming skills were in uh, their infancy, and I can't speak correctly, so my speaking skills are also in their infancy. Oh shoot! I didn't mean to. Oh well, that works. Okay. So, um, what does this do? Auto eliminate rules in the range from start to end. Okay, from start to end, at the beginning of lines, if the buffer does not have laxing enabled, load lax job has not completed this function will fail. Right. So, let's capture some of these concepts. First things first, we need to make sure we have a, a real file, and we want to make sure that that file has tokens that are ready to be used. And, yeah, that's what these three things are checking. Okay. So we can do that. That's if, and let's not name that summary, let's name that buffer. If the buffer exists and, um, let's see. Um, I need to come over to uh, floor coder types, buffer summary. So buffer summary, hold on a second, alright, just double checking, my computer briefly made an odd sound and I wanted to make sure nothing was going wrong, but it looks okay, um, continuing, whoops, continuing, whoops, continuing, there we go. Um, Yeah, I had some weird opinions about how I wanted to format these once upon a time. Anyway, um, exists, ready, buff ready, access flag, size count, is lex. If this not, is not a null summary, this field indicates whether the buffer is set to lex tokens. So let me check something here. In the implementation file here, I have a fill buffer summary function, which is the one that fills out this summary whenever you ask for it, or whenever it needs to be changed, uh, like updated. Um, so what does that do? Tokens exist. It just does tokens exist. I want another one that does uh, those other ones. So let's pop over here to implementation again and auto indent. Um, so if all of these things, if we have the tokens, if, they, if we actually have them, the one on the right is a settings about whether or not we're supposed to have tokens, but this one on the um, that I'm pulling over is about whether or not we actually have the tokens. All right, so if they exist and if they're complete, um, which means if we've done at least one full lex on them, and if we're not in the middle of relexing them, because sometimes we have a complete set of tokens, but we need to edit them. And so there is a difference between having a complete set and having a complete set that is up to date. So that makes sure I have a complete set that's up to date. And I'm going to have um, tokens are ready equals one, else tokens are ready equals zero. Now, my computer is making sounds. Uh, do, do, do. Seems like it's just stuff happening on OBS. My fan is louder than it used to be. I'm not sure what the deal is. Maybe it's just because it's warm today. Alright. Um, if computers were awesome, like every operating system would have a temperature of the computer built into like their task manager. Cause that's what I want to see. Just out of curiosity anyway, I want to see it. Um, okay, so, I'm happy with writing it that way. 
So tokens are ready. That means we need to come over here to the types and extend this with that. So let's put in a doc string. Tokens are ready. If this is not a null summary, this field indicates whether the buffer has up to date tokens available. If the tokens are not, Mibble says that's one thing my, I don't know, conky monitor doesn't show. I, I'm guessing that's your like Arch Linux setup. You're saying you don't have temperature on that either, is that what you're saying? If the tokens are not uh, if this field is false, it may simply mean the tokens are still being generated in a background thread task and will be available later. It could also be because the buffer is not set up. Uh, if this is the, if that is the case, is lext will be true to indicate that the buffer is trying to get its tokens up to date. <sighs> All right, so there's a little documentation, and now uh, what we're going to do is, um, now what we're going to do is, uh, da -da -da -da. Uh, we're going to switch back to implementing auto indent based on the auto indent available here. So, if buffer exists and buffer tokens are ready, right? So if it exists and it has ready tokens, then we're in a good spot. Then what's the next thing that happens? Um, it then switches to result equals true. So it only fails. Let's add that case because I might be using it somewhere else. It can fail or it can succeed. It succeeds whenever the um, the file actually has the tokens to do the job. Basically, if it has tokens ready to go, it always succeeds to do an auto intent. Not necessarily correctly, but by spec, it's supposed to succeed if it has tokens. There's no good reason for it to bail once it gets to that point. Okay, cool. Um, right, so here I'm passing in options, and I have this struct called indent options. I'm just going to keep that because I don't want to change how this works too seriously. So we'll just build the indent options struct out of the flags exactly the way I do right now, and I can copy pasta that. There we go. File auto tab token. So that function there needs to get replaced, and then fill buffer summary doesn't need to be rewritten. So let's go take a look at file auto tab tokens. Uh, this is going to be in file view auto tab tokens. Alright, so what do you do, auto tab tokens? What do you do? Um, so this begins a temporary memory pretty early on. Um, yeah, so we need a um, partition pointer. Part. I'll just grab the global partition for now, I guess. Um, we can pass in a partition later if we need to. And then um, temp memory temp equals begin temp memory on the part. 
and then I think at the end we almost certainly want to end the temp memory or else it's not very temp. Yeah, that's what we do. Alright, what else do we do in this situation here? So here I'm getting the tokens array from the file. Um, I don't know if that's the way this should work. Um, the user could just be given the pointer, could just get a copy of the pointer to the internal token array. Then if they decide to write that onto that pointer, they will successfully mess up the system. Um, on the other hand, forcing them to do a copy hmm don't really want to get in the business of marking it as read only somehow like I don't know setting the pages up that way or something um, I could just ask them not to and hopefully they follow the rule and they break the rule at their own uh, peril I suppose or I can just copy it out to them which is what I do with text I ended up on this same question with text and the question being how do I get information to the user do I give them the pointer that I use internally that points to my internal memory so that if they write to it they mess it up or do I have them copy out um, to their own copy right uh, the way sort of you would copy from kernel space to user space do I do the same property here that's like you don't get to touch my stuff because you could mess me up but I'll give you a copy of it and then you can do whatever you want to with it um, gives you more flexibility less performance <sighs> usually my thinking and like with the text situation my thinking was um, right now 4Coder is pretty performant and I'm trying to keep an eye on that so if we get to a point where someday someone's like I really just need a really fast version of this I can be like alright we're gonna give you a low level access and you know mess this up you're gonna mess everything up but if you don't mess it up then we're in a good spot and you've got more speed but for now but until we need that such a problem solved I'm gonna say let's go with the more robust thing that's less likely to cause bugs for users for now um, and if speed becomes a problem then give the low-level access I feel like that's just the right way to approach these problems um, I'm not sure that it's the right way it's just my feeling on it it's the way I've been approaching them so far so we need to get a copy of this which means I need to know how big it is and then I want to know um, then I want to get okay okay so I need to go something like um, app uh, buffer token count I pass an app buffer and it returns to me the um, token count and then I do um, something like CPP token uh, tokens equals push array on the partition uh, an array of CPP tokens token count um, and then and then it will be something like a uh, buffer read tokens app buffer and I'll give the ability to specify which tokens you want to read so it'll be like I want to read token starting from zero going to token count and the number of tokens should or the tokens should be output right here right so that lets me get these token information um, and I've stored that in a temporary array because I don't need it later. Um, I'll need to get indentation marks. So let's do that. Um, buffer get line index. 
Ah, so that's basically saying here's the start and end position. I need you to turn that into start and end lines. I believe I have this in the API, but I'm going to need to switch to my documentation real quick to find out exactly how to do this. API docs. Um, yep, here it is. So, let's see, types and functions. Um, it's going to be a buffer function, compute cursor. I think it's going to be called compute cursor because anything that talks about computing a cursor is going to help me find the position. It's going to return a cursor uh, to me, or in this case a partial cursor, it looks like. And partial cursors have the information I'm looking for. Um, so yeah, I'm going to call this right here. So that will be bool32 um, got cursor equals whatever the result is from this. Um, and then I need to pass in the app. I need to pass in the buffer. I need to set up a buffer seek, so that's like seek position um, start. And then I need a cursor out. So partial cursor like so. All right. Um, yeah, we can do that that way. Partial cursor, like so. Now, may I ask why this can fail? Um, documentation. So I'm going to go read the code and add to the documentation why this can fail. Um, uh, implementation buffer compute cursor. So let's see if file compute cursor. Okay, so where is that? File compute cursor. Is it in file view? File compute cursor. Here it is. Um, I see. So there are two reasons it can fail. Um, back to the implementation. Let me add to this. So I just said this call. This call can fail if the buffer provided is is not associate if the buffer summary provided does not summarize a buffer that actually it, that is actually an actual buffer in for coder or if the provided seek uh, format is not can is is invalid the valid seek types are seek position and seek line char there we go. So now the um, now the docs should be better. Cool. Um, yeah, it must be really hot today because my fan keeps acting up, but I'm not even breaking the amount of CPU that I normally break with OBS. Like it's running better than normal. Odd. <sighs> Hope the stream is working well for everybody. Okay, let's stay on track here. So, um, I have I already know my buffer is. Uh oh. Okay, it's working. Never mind. I don't know. Sometimes. 
So, uh, anyway, um, I already know the buffer exists. I know, okay, so I'm going to just say ignore the result because we know it has to work. Okay, so that's going to give us the start position. I got to go back to file view CPP. Um, ah, oh, shoot, I'm in the wrong spot. Um, file auto indent, auto tab tokens. There we go. So, um, I need the line start, line end. That's what I was doing. So, in 32 line start will equal the curse partial cursor dot line. I assume it has a line. Um, partial cursor line. Yeah. Okay. And then I need to do the same thing again. Um, on line end. Uh, end. Right, this is just to find out the indexes for the lines that I want to start and stop on, um, which is important because using that information, I when you're auto indenting, basically the problem is you have input is the tokens, right? Or you could think of it as the input is the text if you wanted to make a really hardcore auto indenter. But mine reads from the tokens, not from the text, because I'm not that hardcore. And then uh, the output is can be broken up into two stages. Um, the input, the actual effect is that it changes your buffer. So the ch the actual output is like a set of um, inserts and deletes of white space, right? It inserts and deletes white space. So it's a set of edits that need to be performed to indent the text correctly. But an intermediate layer of that will just be how how far indented should line X B, right? So what I'm trying to find out is what range of lines do I need to do that on? What what line chunk? What set of how many um, numbers do I need to get the indent positions for? And then I use those indent positions to get the edits. Yeah, Ginger Bill agrees with me. It's probably just a better idea to use the tokens directly. Um, the downside to using the tokens directly is you can't... You could imagine making this sort of crazy, like, sort of regex-based auto indenter that would be more flexible for other languages, but since I don't really care about other people's languages um, right now, because I'm just trying to nail this down for one language, that being C and C++, so two languages, um, I just ignore that. Right? Um, I just go with the tokenization. And honestly, if you write your tokenizer for every language that you want to support, it's much better for a lot of reasons to use tokens. Anyway, um, so line start, line end come in here. Um, and now I need to... So here I've got this, which is a function that we're going to need to put here. Um, line start, line end opts tab width and I need buffer um, this is also going to need to know the app pointer uh, and it's going to need to know um, since tokens isn't a token array but just like literally a token pointer it's also going to need to know the token count right so our get line indentation marks is going to be a little different, but we'll write that soon. And then um, from that we'll do this one here, which is make batch result batch. And I have this function here that does the second half. So this here just computes how far to indent each line. Um, and then I need to um, use this function, which basically does the job of given where each line needs to be indented to compute the edits that need to be applied to the existing line. So it reads the buffers line, sees where is it, okay we need to t insert tabs or uh, spaces or delete spaces or whatever we need to do to make these things be where they're supposed to be. And that needs the partition, the buffer, if it gets the buffer it's going to need the app pointer, the line start, the line end, and the options. Right. 
All right, so that makes the batch. Now let's see, if I have a batch, I'm going to do this, and then um, right there I have a debug sort check. I'm going to skip that now because that hasn't ever fired on me ever, ever. So it's obviously not an issue. Um, uh, yes, I think the only thing I need to do is actually do the batch edit because all of this computing, the inverse and all that is kind of internal stuff that the if I'm doing it on this custom side the batch edit um, API is a little nicer so let's go back to the top somewhere around here there's buffer uh, batch edit yes so it takes a string which is all the edits need to be applied the string length the array of edits and the number of edits and then it, it computes the inverse in there for me um, and whether or not this is a white space edit which means it works correctly the other one is a little broken actually uh, maybe we'll debug that today if this gets done if the batch edit succeeds description to do I should do that but I'm going to put it off for now. I'll to do that later. If it bites me right now and I'm not able to figure this out because I didn't write the, the docs, then I'll go write them now. My rule is, for now, I will update the docs when it's useful to me or when someone specifically requests it. And then when I make a big version update, I will clean them up a little bit too. Um, So we're going to assume that it succeeds, because if I will, let's go back here again. Looks like I'm going to find out at least why it might return um, zero. So if it does that, if edit count is zero, it succeeds. Result. I think that that is busted. I think that that's busted because I think it should return true if it does the inner one too. Yeah, so that's not right. This call can fail if the provided buffer summary does not refer to a buffer that to an actual buffer in forecoder. There we go. So we're going to assume it won't fail. Um, stir. So now I need to go back to file view real quick. Um, String base batch dot string base. <sighs> um, batch dot string size. What I should do, if I was clever, is I would make a batch struct that's in the API here whose names line up to the names of the parameters. We'll do that today because I like that idea. Okay. <coughs> okay, so now I need the edits. That's the batch. Back. Sorry about that. Um, mm 
edits batch dot edits it needs to know the there it is batch dot edit count all right and then edit type um, what are my options preserve tokens that's the one I want all right um Yeah, that looks like it all works. So now all we have to do is compile it and um, implement all the. Uh oh. What? I just accidentally deleted all those lines of code just there. Which is a bit um, not good. There we go. Let's try that again. We just got to compile it and implement all the things that are missing. Oh, I hit Alt K. I was like, I was here and I hit that. That's what I did. That's not good. Alt K and Alt M are very close to each other, and one of them is for building, and the other one is for killing a rectangle. I should change that. I should just get rid of Alt K because I have Alt Space now. I don't know if everyone here has seen this before or not, but you can do stuff like this. Right, which is kind of fun, and has a tendency to mess up the auto indent. There we go, because it messes up the tokens because the relaxer isn't really ready to handle that kind of thing yet. Okay. not quite multi-cursor yet. It's not going to be multi-cursor for, you know, three to six months. But um, I do have to admit, after using multi-line editing, it's buggy, but it's also kind of cool. But it's also a pain in the ass. So, you know, I don't know. Got to do what you got to do, I guess, but it is annoying. Um, okay, so we get, we get, okay, so the first error, what is it? Indent options, right. Indent options. just this sort of way to bundle up a bunch of the parameters. Ginger Bill, the plan is um, to turn four coder, uh, how do I explain it? The plan is to turn four coder into kind of um, just buffer and code intelligence kernel, if you want to think of it that way and that there will be a bunch of different sub four coders implemented on top of it. That's why I've been moving towards moving more and more stuff into the custom side because I'm shaving it down to just like here are the things that have to be in the kernel that's not like an operating system. Um, but then what I'll do is I'll have all the mark cur and cursor will be like the Emacs style four coder and then I'm gonna have a Vim style four coder and a Sublime style four coder. Um, there will all be different DLLs you can run it with. Um, that's the like end of this end of twenty end of I don't know, summer of twenty seventeen goal, I guess I would say. Not because this year ends pretty soon, I'm not gonna get but I think I think like one year ahead, my next big goal is to get to the point where you can do that. Okay, so um, we've got indent options, so it should compile now, I guess. 
that was the first error. Oh, no, I gotta update these types, obviously. Once I've fixed the types in here to the correct type for the customization side, it'll work. Ah, shoot. So I haven't implemented the new API that I came up with. I totally forgot why we were even doing this. The reason we did this was because I needed to come up with um, an example of the custom API extension that I was making. All right, implementation. Let's see. Um, I'm replacing auto indents. I'm going to put you right in the same location because that's kind of where you belong. Buffer, what's it called? Token count. Right? And I get the application links. I get the buffer summary. And um, I'm not going to write the doc string yet, so it'll just warn me about it and I'll get the doc string later. I'm going to need the command. No, first thing I need to do is get my file. Alright, so to get the file, I need the um, command after all. The command data structure. Ginger Bill, yeah, if I had any money, what I would do is I would um, get, like, you and Chrono Dragon onto my little team here, like I have in so far as, on Linux. I would put him on Vim, and you on Sublime, and I'd keep maintaining the Emacs style one. And, um, uh, that way, like, you know, a little bit every month, you would be able to make more progress and tell me, oh, we need this and that to do the next thing. That way I, because right now I'm just kind of taking features out so that it's as minimal as possible and then I will over time be able to tell, ah, this is a sort of shared common thing I could help help all of everyone out with or something like that. But I decided if I'm going to do this thing that lets anyone adopt for coder, um, I have to get it as general as possible in the core portion. Um, so it's just going to have how do you edit a buffer, how you render it, how you um, how you parse it will be in the executable. And then like some other basic stuff like how you lay out panels and stuff. And how you interface with the operating system is the other big one. That way it's also portable. Yeah, that's the other thing is a lot of people want, um, I got to get Unicode in here someday, and the order these things will happen in is unclear to me. It could be that Unicode happens before, um, Unicode before I do the generality thing, uh, like before I implement all these DLLs, or I could do Unicode much later. Um, uh, from a certain point of view, it seems like I should do Unicode first, even though I want to rush ahead and get the cool thing done, but it seems like I should do Unicode first because if I don't, I might implement like the Sublime version wrong, like the way you position your cursor might need to be a little bit technically different than the way you want to do it in an Emacs one where you got a marker or something like this because you got a highlight and stuff like that. So, um, so I think I need to do Unicode pretty soon, uh, possibly um, in the 4.2 range because I already know what 4.1 is going to be all about, what I need to work on while I'm in that vert like what I'm gonna do to get to 4.1 has been set up for a while but anyway um, and the reason I was mentioning Unicode is because if I, I gotta support that in general uh, regular expression t style stuff that most editors do for just like at least getting syntax highlighting on everything But then there's also code formatting that would be a lot of fun to do first. It's hard to decide what order to do things in. They're also interesting. All right, so. Oh, shoot. I have this returning a token count. Ah, okay. So this does not return a bool like most of these things. It returns a count. And what we'll do is we'll return a count of zero if, um, if anything goes wrong. All right. Okay, so if I've got my file and 
and I want to check all these things I guess maybe I'll check these things Um, the reason I'm not checking the last one is because this says, "Hey, maybe you're relaxing some new ones in the background, but you could, you could technically read the current ones out um, if you wanted to." Uh, I don't see any reason why you shouldn't be allowed to. You just you should be know you should know that if you uh, want the most up to date ones, wait for this to be true. It's basically the rule. Usually, it's true right away. It's just on a few occasions it has to relax a lot. Like when you change uh, block comments. Oh, by the way, Ginger Bill, just a thought. Something occurred to me recently. I was thinking about how to, because uh, Strange Zach had brought this question up. The problem of how to, lex uh, how to do the parsing of a language um, in parallel. Like say you've got one big file, and he wants to be able to lex it um, with multiple cores. Uh, it's kind of a problem because you got it, it's a very linear problem. You can't figure out what character 5 means if you haven't read 1, 2, 3, and 4. Um, but there are some exceptions to that, and that is, for example, in C++, if you just pick a random character, um, you can guarantee that you find a spot where the, the state of the lexer is predictable by just doing a few things. Uh, one thing you have to do is um, you have to figure out whether or not you're in a comment, and that is the primary, primarily difficult one. And with block comments, it becomes a little tricky because your, you know, your only way of finding out that you're not in a comment is to seek down until you find a star slash. And since in C++ they're not nested, as soon as you see a star slash, you know the thing after that is not. Um, uh, a comment, right? And then you just have to go to the beginning of the next line in case you're in um, a preprocessor like directive. And now here, you know for sure that you can start lexing, and the tokens you make will be correct. Um, you can't parse because you need context for parsing in C++. But you can at least lex starting from this line correctly. So I don't know if um, obviously there's advantages to having nested comments, but without but with unnested comments you can do that trick. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on how to how to do that yourself, but it's just something I was thinking about and I don't know if in Odin you would have a way if you wanted to. It's kind of an odd thing to want to do um, because usually you've got a lot of files to lex when you're thinking about like in my situations and probably I'm guessing in a compiler um, Yeah, insofar as mentions that um, when you have like an if zero block, right, which I can generate with a, like that, um, Vim grays that out, and I like that too. I haven't implemented it yet, just because my only I've only attempted a preprocessor twice, and I didn't give it a very like I I decided I wasn't uh, ready for it because um, the lexer wasn't actually ready. Um, once I once I make a little more progress, I think I'll try the preprocessor again. Um, or at least that's one of the things I, I might get to soon, and then I'll do that kind of thing. Yeah, I'm sure in Odin, the ability to parse in parallel is easier if you have managed to avoid context. Because um, you can pretty much just start any good spot that is like, oh, here's the beginning of a statement or something, and or I guess you'd have to go to something that's at a top level maybe. But then you can just start going, and you're good to go. But he just wanted to know, like, on the lexing level, because he's making um, an OpenGL uh, like auto extension generator thing that figures out what extension functions it needs to generate for you and does just the minimal work. Um, but. Uh, but he was hoping he could do it um, on, you know, threads, multiple threads, the lexing. Anyway, um, all you know he could do is just um, substring, and if it happens to pick up substrings that are 
on like in comments, then it'll be a little bit wasteful. Hmm. I don't know. Um, I'll have to think about that. Maybe there's a way once you've got the substring to figure out information. Anyway, let's get back to the issue at hand. Uh, we need to get the number of tokens. Now this shouldn't be too hard because we have the file. So if I just do count equals and I have to remember how to get the tokens out of a file. So let's go to file.cpp file state undo token array dot count. There it is. So that's how you get that. And now we should have um, the ability to count how many tokens a buffer has. This is really the magic sauce right here, the read uh, tokens function that we're about to make. Read tokens. Um, you get a buffer. You get a first token. You get a last token. And you get um, a pointer to token tokens out. And this right here is like a result zero. Result. Result equals one. And then what we want to do is basically just a mem copy into the tokens out from the file token array and I'm a I'm a bit slow. That should be a state dot right there because I just went and looked it up and seen the file state struct, not the file struct. Okay, file state token array dot tokens and I want um how many do I want? I want oh, you know, that should be plus the first token and I want um the size of a CPP token times the last token minus the first token, which is a good way to get the count of how many tokens I'm reading out. So, um, to recap, I pass in the first token. If it's a zero, I'll be copying right from this t array to this array. And then I use the last token to find out how many I need to copy out. I mem copy that into their output buffer and bada boom. Oh, cool. Thanks for the link. I'll check it out. Alright, so now it should just work, right? That should be the whole thing. Uh-oh. I guess I copied the wrong types a few places. Now it's done. Get line indentation marks. Oh, that's right. I've got to implement that again. Get line indentation marks. That's okay. This is just a really complicated function. It won't take long. Okay. And this is why, by the way, it's going to take a while for this version to come out. Because even though everything is kind of solid right now, there's only like like one bug I still really need to get and a few minor tweaks I'm still just cramming new features in and I need to give it time to to settle out afterwards Ratchet Freak, the le lexing in parallel would be like, say you've got two core, if you lex with not in parallel, one core, you just start at the beginning of the file, you read the, to the text, and every time you see something that you decide is a token, you emit that token to the output stream, and you read more text, right, until you get to the end of the file, and then you go, alright, that was all the tokens. Um, uh, so the problem of lexing in parallel is that um, uh, Strange Zach was wondering if he had a very long file, one single big code file that he wanted to parse quickly. Um, and I can't remember exactly if this was just he wanted to make it better than it was so it could handle giant files, or if he had a big file he needed to 
like use as a source or something. I think he's got like a source file that he wants to parse um, to to generate the solution to the user's query or something. I'm not sure, but um, yeah, I think he was just hoping to make it really fast on extremely large files. It's the only thing that makes sense, and. Uh, so, in parallel, he was hoping to be able to start at multiple spots in the file, I assume. If he just wanted to, to do a lot of files, then yeah, you just do files separately. But the question is, if you have one file that's giant, how do you lex that in parallel? Because hopefully what you would hope you could do is jump to some point and then scan ahead a little bit to find a spot where you're guaranteed, like if you could say at the beginning of a new line you're guaranteed to be able to lex and not have any context that you need to know about from the previous line, then you can lex in parallel. You just jump to a random position, find the next new line character, and then start lexing. Right, and you mark, ah, this is the spot where the previous core needs to finish. Or you allow all of them to overlap by a certain amount to go, or like you allow it to go to the point where it's supposed to end, and then keep lexing to the end of the line to make sure that it covers the gap that the pre the other core isn't covering. You can you, you'd work it out, right? It's details. Just like line it up and fit them in at that point. But you can't do that in C++, and you can't really do that if you have block comments unless you do something clever with them. Um, uh, it's pretty tricky. Although, yeah, besides a few applications, I don't think it's particularly um, important thing to be able to solve. Um, okay, so let's do this first. Int 32t. I just went and sung a Christmas song, and now, um, now YouTube's gonna copyright my my video and monetize it. Whoops. Buffer summary. CPP tokens in 32 token count indent parse state Get first token at line. I'm going to change this a little bit. Partial cursor start partial cursor end and up here what I'm going to do is say um, actually I take it back I wasn't thinking it through I have to do the same amount of work either way so this is still nicer Um, for one thing, um, it's not, if your lexer is good, it wouldn't be too much slower to lex inside the comment. Like, lexing more tokens, outputting more tokens doesn't make you that much more slow. Uh, I mean, it slows you down somewhat if it's complicated stuff, but um, hopefully if the input is the only thing that really matters. So you could do a speculative 
lex situation where you just start somewhere, um, find the first new line, and then start lexing. And if you happen to be inside of a block comment, um, someone else will replace those tokens and go, ah, these were, you know, not good. Um, you know, you could have a thing where, like, you have the first, the core that starts at the beginning is authoritative, and it will overlap the second guy a little bit, and the second guy will then um, overlap the third guy, and so on. So what you can do is say, look, everyone, we know at the beginning you're going to get stuff wrong, but eventually it's going to be right, and what we're going to do is use the previous guy before you to just lex over you a little bit to find where you started getting it right. Um, if you never did start getting it right, we'll just keep going and relax all of it. So hopefully you have a um, like a token grammar that's not too context dependent, or you could get in states where it's like, oh, this whole block is wrong because you missed this one thing that changed what all these tokens mean. Normally, you want your tokens to be much. Um, I mean, I would think ideally, if it weren't for block comments, you could just start at the beginning of a line, and you would always get the line correct when you parsed it. And then block comments. And like multi-line strings and things are the only thing that might mess that up, and that's not too bad. Okay, so um, um, the way this works is I pass in a buffer summary. Yeah, I'm going to need to switch to a token array. So, instead of that, we're going to do a token array called tokens. <coughs> Down here where I call get line indentation marks, I'm going to switch over here to using a token array called tokens. So this is going to be tokens.count. We'll just set tokens.maxCount to equal that uh, and not think about it. Um, cause that's how much we're allocating for it anyway, and we're not actually editing this, but it just might be, I, it, it might be possible to skip this, but I, I, there's no point, we might as well set it, it's not gonna, it's not gonna hurt. Um, so, um, then I want to read in those tokens. Right, and now I have a token array with all the tokens in it. I can um, so what I could do if I was smart only read in the tokens that the tokens in the range we need would be a nice optimization for now I'm reading them all in which is going to make this thing kind of super piggy um, we get the line start, we get the line end, I get the indent marks here, I just do tokens because now I'm using a token array um, like it was expecting before. The reason I switched to that is because hopefully now, um, oh, Hopefully now, yeah, so what we need now is we need to do, a, we need the applications pointer here, or the, yeah, the application links app. Um, um, partial cursor, uh, partial cursor app buffer compute cursor app here's the buffer seek to the line char based on this line and this char and give me the result in this partial cursor there we go so that replaces that and then start position is just um, the partial cursors position right because that we saw we seek to the beginning of that line and then we got the position for that now I call get token. I think that will be an error because I don't think I've included. Yeah. So now what I need is um, right here. I'm going to include for cpp lexer dot h. Whoops. 
Alright, just double checking. Um, ah, did it again. There we go. Wait, no. Leave that like that, and let me do it there. There we go. Alright, so. Uh, so far, it gets the first token at this line. We get the token pointer. Um, that points to our tokens because we don't have access to the other tokens even. Um, if token does not equal tokens tokens, we back up. While token is greater than token tokens, we keep backing up until, yeah, that's just all part of the logic. Um, get line index. Alright, so I keep seeing that, so let's just make that a thing. Static int32 buffer get line index just takes an application links a buffer summary called a buffer and um, a position I believe get line index yeah and it's going to take a partial cursor we're going to compute the cursor on that um, by seeking to this position here and output the cursor like that and then we can return the partial cursor line. All right, that gives me the line that I care about. Alright, so um, let me come down here to where I had the partial cursor and we can clean this code up a little bit so not, now that I'm sort of t making that helper um get line index app buffer start there we go line end <sighs> end line end okay Get first token at line. Why are you feeling? Oh, you need the app pointer. As does this function. Get line index needs the buffer pointer. And then to get the start of that line, ah, da, 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 da. all right. So what I want to do is have this optionally return the start of the line if I ask for it. Um, 32 start. If start, then start equals partial cursor dot char. No, oh damn! In order to get the start of a line, I have to do another one. In thirty-two t buffer get line start. The good news is, even though I have to make all these helpers, it's not actually slow to make these calls. It's just that I don't have all these helpers set up on this side int 32t given a line give me the start of the line all right so this is going to be again like this um, now i'm seeking to align char line character 1 ret da -da -da. And then I want to return the partial cursor's position, because that tells me where the line starts. And this right here was an example of that. So this is like int 32 line start equals buffer get line start app buffer line. Right? Um, get the token, is it in white space, then go to the next one because I want the one to the right of it, not the one to the left of it. Fair enough. In result equals 
tokens dot tokens plus blah, blah and then I return the token okay so what comes up next in my error list because everything looks okay ah right I need to fix that line start alright then what comes next in my list buffer get line index app buffer alright start is just going to equal buffer get line start app buffer line buffer find hard start right oh man okay so buffer find hard start if I remember correctly is actually implemented in file cpp buffer find no is it implemented right in the buffer stuff um, like abstract buffer find hard start yeah so that's pretty low level um, that's not going to port as easily. Um, I do need these. Um, and then I need to implement something like this. Uh, let's see if I can do it. So, the return type is find. Find hard start is going to be a buffer summary. We're going to need the application links. Line start tab width. Um, let's see, so there's my result buffer stringify type, that won't apply data won't apply, size, so none of that really is, well char c will apply um, size that's just going to be buffer size I believe tab width minus equals one buffer find hard start end that sounds good okay so what I need to do is pop over to my include file where I have stream stuff it's a very similar concept but it's just more refined and um, available on the custom side so this is a kind of port correctly um, actually might port more cleanly than the original in a certain sense so I have the chunk which okay gets knitted like so right here for instance I do if init stream chunk Um, here's my chunk, here's the app pointer, here's the buffer summary. Um, I want to start at the line start. Um, the underlying data is going to be something called data chunk, and the size of that will be size of data chunk. Right? Two, three. So there we go. I need to come up here and add in the data chunk. Da, da, da. Okay. So this is oh this is uh, more like four. Um, I did that wrong. So for initialize that um, backward forward. Uh, where is the good? There used to be one for checking if it was good. Let me read an example. Okay, so it is an if. I had that correct. If I, I knit that, 
I set up a still looping. Ah, that's how I do these. I see. And then a do loop. Yes, this is very nice. And then I ignore all that nonsense. Here's the f inner for loop. And then still looping is equal to forward stream chunk. Here's the chunk. Well, that should be called the stream to make this match my other uses. Here's the stream. Here's the stream. And that, that continues while we are still looping. Um, yes, very good. So, from the top, we begin the stream here. If it succeeds, um, we say, all right, while we're still looping, or do this while we continue to loop. Um, right, so that needs to be while result char position, which started off, okay, it's initialized up here. I'm going to put it right there where everything else gets initialized. Um, uh, while that's less than end, by end I mean the stream dot end. I move to the next value, good, and then I read out of the stream um, from that position. And if it's a new line or a zero, then it's all white space. What tr tr true? Um, go to um, go to the end of this loop. Breakout basically. Break out down here. Um, double break is what I normally call that now. Now that I've learned that l l um, labels are local to their functions. Um, yeah, let's see. So if go to double break, if C is um, somewhere in that range, then it is a hard character. So we go to the double break. If it's a tab, I increase by the tab width. If it's not a space, then I say, ha, ah, this is not all spaces. Then I go um, indent position plus equals one. And then we go, um, all right, if we haven't broken out yet, then we try to stream forward even farther. And what I want to do is I want to say, Yeah, because this system on the right, well, let me go read how I did it over there. So buffer, where is that buffer abstract? Whoops, I didn't, didn't want that. Save that, not delete it. Um, da -da -da -da. I feel like this will have a bug um, the way it's written right now. I just want to pass a zero through this loop, but it's a little tricky. What I would like to be able to do is say something like if char position equals the end, the size of the file, then um, set that equal to C and do it set C equal to zero and pass it through. Um, if my streaming system was smart enough to give me null characters when you keep lexing past the point, it could work. Or if I had the option to ask for a null character at the end, that'd be great. Could do one at the beginning too. Yeah, I feel like I'll do that. Let's take a moment to extend the streaming system while we're making everything else unstable and uh, more future-rich. Uh, let's go to the include CPP. Um, 
init stream chunk. I want an option for bool32 use extra null add uh, null terminator. That'll be set true will indicate pl that I want it to give me an extra null terminator past the end. So let's see, how do I want to do this? So the chunk gets initialized and I tell it the data size and blah blah blah. I'm gonna just have it have a flag here that says add null terminator or we'll just call that add null um, add null um, that's not a very long line why don't I just pop it up here so I can read it um, if the max end is greater than the size or if max end equals zero then max end is the size right so max end how did that get set max end max end chunk max end oh yeah you can set that from oh that's what i do that's what i do that's right that's very that's very clever i like that plan okay so let's go up to the stream chunk and uh, what I did was I said, hey, why don't I just, oh, that's such a neat API trick. Just like magically add optional parameters without breaking anything. As long as their default value can be zero. Um, um, add null. And so if I ask it to add null, then the trick is if we get to the point where I ask for it to stream forward, um, if chunk start is less than chunk end, yeah, yeah, max end. So what this does, it says, is the chunk end less than the buffer size? If it is, it iterates forward and grabs a new chunk. Otherwise, it will fail. No, not in this case. It wasn't that it was too clever for me to understand. It was more like it was too clever for me to think of it a second time because I'm doing the same thing again. It's clever in the sense that it's a good API idea, not clever in the sense that it's a tough thing to write the code for and debug. It's actually the opposite. It's just something, it's the idea is, basically the idea is instead of adding more parameters making this thing get really really long so that later you're reading all these parameters and like I don't know what I want to set all these to normally they have default values that you almost always want so um, I, I said the user can just set them in the chunk when they want them right you just set chunk dot blah equals blah before you do the rest of the init and that means that um, you basically said I want to use these default these special parameters right now um, and so the only time it could possibly confuse you is when you go to write the code that uses it. If you read the function that doesn't have the parameters, um, then maybe it'll confuse you. But it makes everything very nice and easy to handle in most places. Um, yes. Okay, so... Um, what we're going to do is, look, this says, look, if chunk n is less than buffer size, however, um, there's another reason why chunk n might be equal to buffer size, which is that it's just giving you the last full chunk, and now what I want to do is say, let's go one further, else if the chunk um, add null has an add null parameter, and chunk n plus one is less than buffer size then I want to um, let's see I want to set um, doo -doo -doo. 
read the buffer into base data. Yeah, so I want to set chunk base data zero equals zero. That gives it a null terminator. And I want to set um, I want to set the chunks start to the buffer's size. And I want to set the chunks end to that value plus one. And then I want to set um, uh, uh, the chunks data to the base data minus my current chunk start value and then we can result true that. So what this basically does is says if we're in the special case where I'm adding a null and I haven't added the null yet then mark that I've added the null by moving the start and, si and end to indicate a null um, write the null in there because the null might not actu isn't actually going to be something you can read out but you can just write it into the chunk and then set the data pointer to have the offset. It's an offset trick I do so you don't have to do the offset. As you're streaming across you don't want to have your iterator constantly go back to the zero. Um, Ginger Bill, I don't know about absolute speed. I know it's about 1.4 times faster than like it can in the time that um, it takes to lex one file using the 4010 lexer. Um, the 4011 lexer can lex 1.4 files of the same size. So it's definitely faster. I don't know how fast it is. Um, and that 1.4 speed is when you aren't doing like crazy chunking at the like per character basis. If you if you chunk it up per character, it's about the same speed, um, which uh, is kind of odd. Sometimes it's a little slower or faster, but um, if you give it like just a few big chunks and you don't do much to throttle the output so it just gets the output as quickly as it wants then it, it runs at um, 1.4 speed up. Um, I guess that is in yeah um, using my 10 megabyte file here's what we'll do we will say the 10 megabyte file that I demoed years ago it's only like a year and a half ago um, uh, that in release mode took about one second to lex in the old one, which means it probably takes about 6, 0.66 seconds to lex now, maybe roughly a little more, 0.7 seconds to lex. Um, so, I mean, 10 megabytes, 0.7 seconds. I don't know if that's any good. Might have been less than a second optimized. Maybe second was debug. I can't remember. It, mm, I'm gonna say it was. It was not, not. It was not faster than a second in release mode. I mean, the good news is my project is in 10 megabytes at all. It's like probably not even one. It's probably like. 40,000 lines of code. Some of them are like 40 or 80. Hmm. It could be like a quarter of a megabyte maybe. Maybe half a megabyte at most. So that's a 40,000 line project. I guess if you had a really big project like um, a thousand times more than that you might start having something like uh, an issue compiling with my lexer. I don't know. Of course, I'm not running anything in parallel there either. I don't know. Um, like I, that's that's just one big file. If you run, it can run four times faster than that when you are actually compiling with it, or however many cores you have faster. I always think four because that's what my computer ha here has. So I'm always like, oh, parallel means four times faster. Obviously. All right, so that's that one. Let me do the stream backwards. Just I'm not using stream backwards, but I might as well implement the feature now while I have it fresh in my memory. Um, chunk start minus one as chunk start. Chunk start is greater than zero. 
chunk start is greater than negative one, then chunk start equals negative one, chunk end equals zero, and chunk base data zero, and the data thing, like so. So now if you want to, you can stream all the way to index negative one and get a zero at the beginning. And I do know I, I have like at least two plans for speeding it up more because I'm not one thing I'm doing that's really slow is when I hit a, an identifier to check if it's a keyword I just li I linearly loop over it I don't have like a hash table set up or anything so uh, it's probably not as fast as it could be by any stretch of the imagination because I, I I'm sure that every time it hits a key an identifier which is very frequently it's it's losing a lot. Uh, speed there. Uh, we'll get it fixed soon. Then it'll be way many times faster than my previous lexer. I'm guessing anyway. Maybe I won't be. But I think if I make a big enough hash table, it'll just be destroyed. Okay, so um, I can now tell this system here that I want the stream to uh, add a null. I can just tell it, please add a null for me while I'm looping. So now it will give me a C equals zero here and the rest of the code works exactly the same way. Um, Okay, so I think that will help me find the hard start the way I needed to. Let's see what the next problem is. Initialize but not referenced. Alright, we don't need size anymore. Cool, cool. I might be wrong. It might have been more than a. Si I feel like there was. I feel like. I feel like it wasn't taking longer. It was something around a second to lex the ten megabyte file. Although. Um. If I do the actual math, because it's not actually ten megabytes, since you just gave me some numbers, we will we'll crunch the ratio, and I'm guessing that that is probably kind of close. Um, and one second isn't a hard measurement. Um, oh yeah, yours is in Unicode too, which is going to be harder. But um, yours is 2.7 megabytes and mine was something like 9.6 megabytes. So we'll take that ratio there. So mine should take about 3.5 times the time yours took if it's the same. Um, it could also be a process ratio as insofar as points out. Um, and then uh, let's see I had about roughly this is a completely unmeasured one second was my guess and yours was 0.443 so yeah mine looks like it was like a, by a factor of um, I don't know 2 to 3 basically a little faster than yours, and that was not doing Unicode. Um, and that was my old Lexer. I haven't timed that though. It might have been slower, and then maybe I'm overestimating its speed. But I felt like it was pretty fast on op are you are you testing that with optimized code by the way because I know when I tested with unoptimized code I was much I was slower by obviously a factor of about several seconds but in that case my new one is probably crazy fast at least on uh, 
at least on the uh, spectrum of speeds that you and I are discussing here, Ginger Bill, this new Xer is probably one of the. I, I, I said it before. I think it's the, the like the best little tight thing I've ever made. Yeah, so it sounds like yours is um, pretty competitive with my original one and possibly even the new one. Strange Jack is right. I'll never get this new version done if I keep chatting. That isn't actually what Strange Jack said. He just asked when it was coming, but the answer would be never if I didn't stop chatting with, the, with, the, with everyone else. So if I ask to find hard starts, we do that. First token outline, um, and my new one is th there's there's it's running in slow mode now. What I want to do is make just like the crazy fast version that would because I was getting an even better speed up of like 1.6 versus the old one um, until I implemented some of the resumability. If I said, look, you have to give me the whole thing with the null terminator, and if you run out of output space, it will that's it. It's done. It's not cannot resume. You gotta like always make sure you give me enough output space if I gave it that um, constraints I could make it a quite a bit faster because right now there's a lot of branching that it has to com like it has to walk through code that tries to branch it and do some logic to make to maintain its state I could make it faster if I just said look you have to it has to succeed in one call I can make it pretty fast But I prefer the flexibility because it's cool. So that's the one I've released right now. Seek matching token backwards. All right. Seek matching. Where is this? Where is this? Okay, it's not in there, obviously. It's going to be in file view. Seek ma ah, it's right here. Seek matching token backwards. So seek matching token backwards is just a thing that I have, and I'm going to implement it again. And by that description, you probably have realized that I don't remember it at all. So here are my tokens. Here's the token. I'm seeking a matching token backwards. Um, here's the open type. Here's the close type. I know what that means. Um, here's the nesting level. Um, here's the token. It's less than those tokens. Um, or no, if it is, then I set it equal to that. Elserwise, what I do is um, I loop and I start going backwards. Because like I said, it's backwards. I, I, I explained from the beginning that it seeks backwards. I don't know how that didn't make sense. I make sure that I'm not looking at a preprocessor body because, you know, got to ignore those. They don't mean anything. Um, and then if you get the token type is equal to your close type, you increase your nesting level. That's all. You increase the nesting level when you look at your close type. Oh, because we're seeking backwards, so we're looking for a matching open bracket, I'm guessing. Um, and that means I increase the nesting level because I moved backwards through a close type. And then if I see an open type, oh, well, obviously what I have to do is if I'm at nesting level equals zero, then I've found the one I needed to find. Otherwise, I decrease the nesting level, so maybe the next one I find will be the one. And then I finally, if I get to the end, if I ever terminate, I have found the token I want and I return it. Makes perfect sense now that I've read all the code. Actually, I knew what it did from the beginning. What am I saying? Uh oh, what's happening? It's doing the thing. This is what I was talking about before. It's doing the thing. So, I'm still on the same command map. I'm still on user zero, and yet it doesn't recognize any of my inputs. What's happened? What about you? Do you recognize my inputs? You don't recognize. Ah, ah. 
Okay, let's say I show mouse. No, allow me to show my mouse. Okay, I can't show mouse. I can't backspace. I can insert. I can't do anything. Okay, click on you, click on you again. Open that and yeah, this is the bug that I don't understand. It doesn't recognize any of my keyboard input now, except it recognizes character input, so something still works. Something still works. So when it receives that character input, it's dispatching correctly to an insert character command. But if I hit left key, nothing happens. Right? And if I hit H, it doesn't recognize that. It says unrecognized still. It's like it didn't catch that. If I hit backspace, it doesn't understand. If I hit delete, it doesn't understand. If I hit um, sp control space, I think it puts my cursor in the right spot. Um, if I hit control R, it works. No, it did not move my mark. So it can't move my mark right now. Um, if I hit alt tab and I alt tab back, it's fixed. It's an alt tab bug. It's got to be an alt tab bug. And why am I still not getting recognized uh, keystrokes here, people? What is this? So that's an alt tab bug, right? It's got to be an alt tab bug. I don't understand. Now it's all back. If I alt tab around, I had this up and then I went like that and then I went like that and then I went like that and now it still works, but I still don't have I still don't have recognized keystrokes, which is odd. Why would you say you don't recognize the keystrokes? My debug views bugged right now, and I don't understand why. I can't debug it because I can't compile yet. All right, let's get this thing compiling, and then we're going to spend 100% of our effort figuring out what's going on with my keyboard input. It is fucked. It's going to be this one. This one isn't ready to compile yet. Next. Compute this indent. Alright. That's good. That function's only really complicated as well.
All right, so there we go. I got get line indentation marks to work. Now I just got to get make batch make batch work. So here's make batch result. Why is that so far away from? I don't, I don't understand. Make batch. What dumbass laid out all this complicated code in the worst way possible? Who even writes this? <sighs> all right. A buffer summary that's going to need to be static, and this is going to need the application links. What are you talking about? You're right, it takes seven. Indent. Huh, I must have accidentally deleted or some shit. Okay. God damn it. All right, I really got to figure out how I can get the platform side to be independent of all the custom stuff since it has to implement a few of those functions it ends up having to include a ton of types that it doesn't really need. Um and I should really figure out how to separate out the ones that it needs from the ones it doesn't but the problem is it also wants to call a few of them which means it needs to declare the whole struct which means I need a way to to, to reason about the layout of the struct which is just uh, so much more complicated than what I'm doing right now night night ginger bill what time is it by the way 7.22 p.m. let's see tomorrow my day starts at 10.30 a.m. so I can keep going Okay, so now in theory, um, nothing will be different at all because um, I implemented that auto indent thing. But I haven't called it anywhere. So what I should do now is I want to tell all people across the world that if you're using the old auto indent, And what I should do is before I go ahead and screw up everything, um, copy that there. Okay. All people of the world, if you're using auto indent from the custom API, you're going to need to report to me for reprogramming. And I mean that in the nicest way that a human can possibly mean reprogramming. Okay, now everything should be totally broken. Or maybe if it's a really bad day, it'll look like it's working for a while. Here we go. 
So open up some code file, like the auto tab test. Let's just see. Oh, oh, I can't move anything. I'm having I'm having the bug again, and it's happening with the debugger up. Okay. Um Okay, so that's still working now. Okay, hold on, hold on. This is a unique and rare opportunity. I want to see if I can catch it in the act. So, um, mm, Windows messages. Um, um, yes, put a break point right there. Okay, so I've got a message. Now let's walk through and see if the down key gets screwed up at any point. By the way, now that I'm excited and standing up, did I mess up my... Yeah, I have to sit back down. Alright, alright, alright. I'll sit down, but sometimes I switch to standing when I'm not streaming, is all I will say about that. <sighs> okay. So... No previous state. Okay. Count is less than that. I don't have a key. What? I've got a key value already. Key code lookup table W param forty. All right, something weird's happening here. Um, VK um, down. VK down. OX28. Okay, C calculator, calculator, calculator. Come on. Do it in your head. Um, 2 means 32 plus 8, that's 40. Okay. <sighs> okay, so the key value was 40, which means that this went to the 40th index in this table and it got back a 3. Is someone forgetting to memset that to zeros? But then it would never work. Someone write over the key code lookup table? Key code lookup table. Where is this defined? Is this defined? Ah, here it is. So VK down. Oh, it's supposed to be a 3. Because this is, ah, it's a down key. And it's all the keys that work this way that are getting fucked up. So this is something about it, I think, maybe? Because, like, control O works correctly. I can always open a file and then open the one I wanted again. But things like space, is space on here? No, wait, space normally works. Because I can normally insert space, like I did last time, I inserted space. But what, what have I, arrow keys don't work, backspace doesn't work. Um, F2 didn't work. Okay, so let's keep going. So here we are, and we say, uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh, is this because of... I got a useful event? Hmm... break. So what happens next right here? Do I keep looping this way? I got a useful event. The frame begins. 
I get my mouse X and mouse Y. So, okay, let's just keep going. Get key stick, persistent control keys. I get the persistent state update. Key data. One press. Okay, press three. We have a modifier. Of zero. Uh, what? Actually, are you talking about? Modifier caps index. That's in um, four coder types. Shift. That doesn't make a lot of sense. That implies that this thing here thinks the shift key is pressed. Oh no it doesn't. What is this? Where did I see the shift key pressed? I thought I saw... Okay, so the persistent... Not sure what this is actually. It looks like I'm copying the the modifier state as of now in a completely erroneous way that's getting ignored, and then per key I'm storing the modifier state correctly, which is what I actually use. If I remember correctly. So let's just ignore that. It's not to anything to do with modifier, because if it was control being held or shift being held, I would still see movement. and I would see capital letters and stuff out of window blah 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 oh, trying to kill perform kill no one sending an exit signal so we come in here we check to make sure files are up to date no change signals, so nothing happens. We reorganize the panels to deal with changes in the m monitor size, but no monitor size changes have happened. We prepare the input information. So, how many press count? What's the press count here? Okay. So I'm getting a press of zero there. That's the down key with a modifier again. Uh, uh, huh? da, da. Back that up. I thought you told me there weren't modifiers being pressed on this key. What was that you were saying? Yeah, right here, you're all like, no, we don't got modifiers pressed. Look, look at the, look at the, where'd that mem copy go? Ah, look at the key data here. Look at all the presses. Oh, it does have modifier pressed. If 
fascinating. Okay. So let's keep going. I just want to see if that is the reason that it like doesn't recognize it or some shit. Um, Cause that's also mysterious. And while we're in here, might as well get it done. If I have an input filter, I apply it. That doesn't touch anything but the mouse. Um, I s presume. Yeah. So it looks like it's got just a down key with a shift held, apparently. Uh, mouse event. Why is that not one line? That's not that long. Okay. Anyway, if press L or press R, then um, stuff. Did either of those happen? No. If I press L, no. If I press R, no. Wheel? No. Okay. So now I deal with the mouse hover status. Alright, we just figure out where we are. Update child processes. Don't have any child processes. That doesn't take much time. We come in here to prepare to start executing commands. We set up the command data for this frame. Um, we are figuring out who the active panel is, the active view, screen de uh, dimensions, no key event data, no, there we go. Um, what, actually? Okay. Um, just trust it for now. I think that that makes sense. This is the first step. So, um, this is not the first step. I'm lying. So we skip that stage. We are not trying to kill, so we skip that stage. Um, init the available input. So here's the key summary. We have one key. It's a down key with a shift press. We initialize it. Now our available input struct has that information. And here we're going to begin setting up the debug data. So the debug data has a zero on this frame count. Key data count is one. Preserved inputs. Minus one. So this frame count equals one. We mem move everything. Events right from events to key fifteen. Move those around. We copy in the new one. So the new key here is three. What are all these events? Why do what do they what do they say? Here's the three. Here's other things I've pressed. Um, apparently I pressed 15 a few times. A space showed up right here. Ones showed up. So let's take a look over here at four coder types. No, not four coder types. Uh, the key codes. Do I have the key codes? I don't have them up. Um, yeah, so a 1, that was me trying to press backspace. A 15, that was me clicking. Um, um, and the rest of these don't show up over there because they're just normal characters. Okay, that's fine. So... We said that this guy doesn't have a consumer yet. No one's consumed it. And um, we set up its other data. So is this a hold? No. Is this being in control, shift, and shift? Yes, it is being shifted. So question. Was this one shifted? Yes. Was this one shifted? It shifted and alted. Alt D. Yeah, that was the one that opened the. Yeah, so it thinks shift is down on all of these. Is that the bug? Is that the only bug? I mean, 
that might mess up the keys. It doesn't mess up these, I guess, because they get dispatched in a different way, maybe? Um, they get, like, translated, I should say, in a slightly different way, since they're not key codes. Um, so update the command data to reflect changes that might have happened so far. Um, because there were no command or coroutines, no changes actually did happen. I create what's called dead input and active input so that I can pass dead input to certain people and active input to others. And then I get the current mouse state from the available input. Um, go everybody to zero. Um, Let's see. Let me go to each view. It's animating. Did it consume any keys? No. So this hasn't consumed anything. Change context in step. Did not happen. So I take the active. I take um, input summary here, and I'm gonna do. Are we showing that? We're showing debug, so we don't care. Max y. Do step file view. We update. We process all the GUI information. Are we animating? Did we consume a click? No, no. Um, does not have a suggestion. No, it does have a max y suggestion. So just the same thing it was before. If we need to do any scrolling, we don't. We update the scroll region, it stays the same. We go to the next one. So this one here. Does it have any GUI work to do? The answer should be no. So it should do that. Um, Showing GUI none is true this time. If we have a file, we do that, otherwise we'd get that. There we go. That should just be an assert now. Um, Alright, so we compute the max y. It's not really the issue right now. Nothing's animated or consuming clicks. No max y suggestion. No need to update the scroll stuff, update the scroll region, update the command data. Okay, so nothing happened there. That was just processing GUI stuff, which isn't really being heavily the issue. Um, now I get key data. Key data. Um, I loop across my keys. I'm not in the middle of a command coroutine, so I go to state edit. And if I get here, I get a single key out, which is the down key. We set that as the current command key. Then we say, all right, here's the view that is currently active. Here is, um, we get the command map that we need. Ah, no, we just did an extraction, command bind, and we didn't get anything. All right, so let's, let's look there. I'm guessing it's because the shift key is being pressed. It doesn't, it doesn't check that when I press characters, because with characters, it just looks at the translated character that I pass along with it. But since there's no translated character for a down key, it's probably um, applying the shift modifier and therefore not working. So I, while I have a map, I have a map, map extract. I come in here. I'm using the shift key, so we then set up the command, uh, oh, what do you want to call it, like flags there, the modifier flags. Um, here's the character with no caps locked down, that code is zero, so we get the key code, we do a map find, and we use the command flags as they are, which means when we do that, we don't get any results. Okay. So now the question is if I go back to Win32, I've got this 
shift thing going on. Um, let's skip to there. Let's get to the state where that isn't happening. Um, Okay, so right now, the input chunk transient, no, transient, persistent, control keys, it still thinks shift is down. So here's a question. When does it get the impression that shift is down versus not? How does it figure that out? It's watching this. If shift is ever pressed, comes through here and we process it. If it's that, we set that to reflect whether or not this thing is down. I have a theory. Maybe that got set and because of some weird alt tab stuff that I might be doing still. And I am can catching the cancel mode and just doing the exact same thing default does. When I regain focus I'm supposed to set all the control keys to zero. All right. So let's try some stuff. That won't work because it messes everything up. But control keys, control and alt. Here I do a bunch of work to figure out whether control and alt are actually being pressed or not based on annoying rules of uh, alt greater or alt gr or whatever it is called. So, if I hit right, it thinks I pressed shift right. Yeah, it definitely thinks I'm holding shift down. If I hit shift, now it's fixed. Now if I hit shift again, still fixed. If I hit alt tab, Oh, that's caps lock. Whoops. Caps lock up. Caps lock down. If I hit Alt Tab, whoops, that's not what I wanted. If I hit Alt Tab and back, still good. If I hit something like Alt Tab and then I hit Shift Tab. And then I come back. Okay, what if I hit Alt Tab, Shift Tab, and I come back? Okay, what if I hit Alt Tab? Okay, what if I hit Alt Tab, Shift Tab, Shift Tab, Tab? Okay, what if I hit Alt Tab, Shift Tab, keep Shift held down, and let go there? Hmm. Alt tab tab, alt tab tab, alt tab tab tab, alt tab shift tab shift tab, alt tab alt tab alt tab. Everything works. 
alt tab, alt shift tab, alt tab, everything works. Alt tab, shift tab, everything works. Alt shift tab, alt tab, it's broken. Ah, what well if I alt shift tab, alt tab, it's broken. If I hit alt shift tab, when I come back, it didn't clear it to zero. Interesting. Okay, so Alt Shift Tab brings that up. Alt Tab again. Broken. There it is. Whenever I'm on Four Coder and I hit Alt Shift Tab, that's when it breaks. If I hit Shift again, it's fixed. So I figured it out. Let's figure out how we fix it. So the problem is here I set it to true and no this is the theme I use when I'm debugging this is the one I use when I'm running the theme, the debug uh, I'm running it through the debugger so I can tell the difference between that one and the real one which is also not the Hajort should theme today it's the stub theme So, why is it not doing this, is the next question. So, suppose I do that, and that. The persistent keys currently don't show anything. Fine. Now, suppose I, yeah, we're good. Now, I hit Alt-Shift-Tab. I alt shift tab all the way over here. Now when I go back to it, we come here, the controls. Oh so the controls get cleared to zero, but that is only for mon monitoring alt like and control. Nobody's clearing to zero this because it's a part of control keys not controls <laughs> how stupid Man, there's a lot of action in the chat all of a sudden. Hey, everybody. Oh, I see what happened. We have a spam situation. Thank you, Mibla, for handling the spam situation I was unaware of. And thank you to ever just hosted my stream. Very appreciated. Wait, no, that was one of the spammers. The person hosting my stream was one of the spammers. I don't appreciate it at all. All right, so um, let's see. Uh, da, da, do.
Yes, so it's compiling, and I fixed the bug. Ah, so I can go back to fixing, checking if the new auto indenter works. Oops, caught on a breakpoint. Continue. Yeah, you know, honestly, uh, I don't really care. Um, you can view me or not, it's fine. But uh, writing a bunch of nonsense in the chat when I'm discussing things with people. Uh, it's the same thing as spam, uh, no matter what you call it. Let's see. Um, da -da -da -da. So I want to like, oh, I want to go to here and look at my auto tab. Auto tab. Now, this shouldn't work because it's a brand new auto tabber and it's a tricky problem. Ah, there it is, right there. So, the initial auto tab works. but it indents it doesn't it doesn't okay so it computed the right line indentation amount you see like if i indent that just this line right here or like that it indented this by the right amount and this and this because they all started at zero but this which has a character there it left that character there and inserted so it's just doing an insert i need it to be smarter it's supposed to subtract out the existing amount and it's not doing that for some reason so since it's not that means there's a bug and we didn't have a bad bad day where everything worked the first time so let's go see why that might happen so buffer auto indent what happens in here let me read it again I get the indentation marks that part worked kinda magically but make batch from indent marks was not so magic Oh, dude, this drunk Dane, I gotta tell you, uh, things are gonna get really fancy when just about any of my next plans happen. It doesn't really matter which one I do next. Um, it could be the layout engine. Uh, it could be if I do code formatting. Did you guys see? There was somebody who tweeted at me this video. Um, I'll pull it up real quick. It's kind of neato. Um, oh, oh. Uh, oh, actually, I don't know what YouTube will show. It always shows weird things like politics and celebrities, and I always say not interested. Like YouTube has a really hard time personalizing for me. I don't understand why. Um, let's see, uh, we want, um, right, so this talk right here, um, I'm not bringing it up because I think it's awesome, uh, but, um, uh, it's kind of neat. 
Um, they, what these people did was they um, did basically what I want to do with code formatting, but they also messed up the editor in a few ways that I don't like. But um, the cool thing that they did, which is what I've been, you know, wanting to get to doing someday, was they left the code, and they were writing in Java, but they left the code the way it was. They didn't try to do a visual editing thing by abandoning the underlying text. And that's important because that means you can post your code on normal coding places. Um, you can... Uh, you can... Um, Oh, I'll put the link on the on the thing real quick in the chat. Um, you can post it and stuff like that, but they added like code formatting here, which is kind of small actually. I wish that they hadn't have it side by side because like who cares about this guy? I just listen to him when it shows over here. But like if I can find good examples of um, like where it shows. Because here, this guy's showing like how you edit with it, which I thought wasn't like it's a little bit clunky in my opinion. It, I don't think I don't know. I don't think I would like the editing scheme the way it is, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's just the natural way it goes once you have it. But what I do like is that um, like here you can see they've organized it in a way where you've got blocks that highlight different part, parts of the code, so you can um, sort of do stuff like that. And like the they don't really actually have an example of code line wrapping here but I want to do a thing where if you type past the end it doesn't it just keep and there's no such thing as scrolling to the right anymore it just keeps it sort of like a word document flowed for you and I want to do um, like I like this here where you can break out of the loop and it like colors things in a way that um, connects them although this is kind of too busy with this line here um, but I kind of like some of the concepts here, and they actually got the idea right that you leave the code underneath the same, I think. So, um, this was one possibility I might try to build towards in terms of some presentation ideas similar to this. <laughs> um, you guys have to, like, um, yeah, I don't mind if you guys want to, like, I don't know, dump a bunch of, uh, viewers in here and even make the chat super busy, um, about off-topic things, but this, um, I was just annoyed because it looked like spam, and I don't know. It's spam is sometimes an annoying problem too. So and and griefers, you know. So uh, I would I don't know. Other than that, I don't mind if you screw around on Twitch. It doesn't bother anybody. All right, so. Anyway, um, that was a cool video, kind of. I watched a lot of it just because it's related to what I'm working on here, um, the code edit or the code presentation. So that's another thing I might do. This drunk Dane is code presentation. I might also do, um, uh, you know, a whole number of things. Unicode. Um, getting kind of dark. Um, yeah, there's just a lot of different fancy things that I'm going to get to soon since I'm running out of the basics. They're kind of just getting set up the way they need to be set up. Okay, so somewhere in here it goes wrong. Um, I loop across the lines. I get the start of each line. I find the hard start. I'm gonna bet you that this is where it goes wrong right here. Buffer find hard start okay yeah this is getting used get line in it all over the place actually compute this end end 
So this could be where it's going wrong. Not totally convinced. Um, okay, so um, uh, let's see. We get the correct indentation. We say, was this all white space? Then if we're leaving blank lines, then the correct indentation is 0. Then we say, if the correct indentation is negative 1, then the correct indentation is hard start indent position. Ah, uh, yeah, that's how I signal to just use whatever. Um, is already there, right? Um, this is important for block comments and multi-line, single-line comments. Okay. Um, if it's all white space and the character position is greater than zero, greater than the start position, it's greater than the start. Start. I see line start. Okay. Um, So, da, 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 correct indentation equals indent position. Then, if I'm all white space and the char position is greater than line start, I'm not sure that I understand what that means. Char position greater than line start. Okay, or if it's not all space, meaning there was like tabs in there or something, or if the correct indentation does not equal hard start in an, uh, indent position. Yeah, oh, thank you, Midlow. Um, yes, I'm writing a text editor. Um, uh, code editor cross-platform IDE, etc. All possible ways to look at it. Um, and I'm using my text editor too. Um, so correct indentation does not equal the hard start dot indent position. Okay, so this is where we currently are positioned. If that does not equal where it's supposed to be, or if it's not all space, then we're going to replace it with tabs. That to do option um, only replace spaces if we are using space based indentation let's see um, so um, I still don't know what that means if we're all white space a whole completely white line and the char position it's greater than the line start char position. I feel like that doesn't make any sense because that means char position is um, like if it's non-empty. But if it's 
if it's empty, if it's not empty, we're still going to part, like, redo it because of this. I feel like, see if the first clause can just be removed because it's dumb. There we go. Okay, so, I'll make a new edit. Um, set the string start to string size, correct indentation. I push an array here, which is um, I fill up with spaces or tabs and spaces, depending on um, whatever I need to do. And that edits length is J. The start is at line start. The end is at the char position here. So this should be replacing everything from there to there, which means char position is coming out as zero every time. Um, buffer find hard start. Um, result. Okay, let's see. So result starts at line start. Um, I'm incrementing char position all the way through. So uh so So that doesn't make any sense. All right, I give up. I'm going to use the debugger. Now that I've kind of wrapped my head around the way I think this is supposed to work, the only thing left to do is to see where it's going wrong. Um, here, line 446. Uh, oh, I don't have it open yet. Forcoder auto indent dot cpp. Um, Four hundred and forty six. Yeah, right here. <laughs> okay, so take me to auto tab here. And um, suppose I try to indent this range here. So line I is line 4. I come in here to do this. And um, all space is true. Indent position is 0. Char position is 42. Add a null to the end of the stream for me. And, um, oh, whoa, it failed. That's unexpected. So let's look in there. The chunk is, oh, shoot. Yeah, it expects me to clear these to zero first. Control open, auto tab, indent, come in here, init the stream chunk, 
There we go. While I'm still looping, char position is zero. Stream end is. Wait, what? Oh, I started from zero this time. Okay, that's fine. So I read whatever I get. It's not. There it is. So we come to double break. There we go. And so we end up with that. All right, next line. You know, can we actually just see if it works first? Uh, look at that. All right, let's see. Okay. So nothing breaks. Um That looks right. The line of stars has been remained straight. Those all lined up. These stated zero. That lined up there. Um, that lined up there, and it's in there. There we go. Okay. That all worked. That lines up with that. That's correct. That comes down to here. That lines up here. These guys all got lined up. Um, yeah, I didn't mess that up. This got indented. And, um, yeah, okay. So, there we have it. The new auto indent system. Now, I am so confident that that is not broken which is a lie, that I'm going to now delete the old one. Um, the real motivation isn't that I think it works, it's just that uh, I don't want to have two copies of the code. So, let's see, can I get rid of this, or is anyone else using it? Nope, just this guy? Alright, so what if I get rid of um, this? How many people are using that? Just that guy there. Okay. How about I come up here and get rid of that big beast? Okay, no new errors there. Supposing I got rid of this one. Okay, what if I get rid of that and that? Okay, uh, what about this one? Okay, this one? Looks good, and this one? Indent options is used in more places. All right, so let's go visit this one. All right, so here we go. Delete you, delete you, delete you, 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 all of you, delete it, bye, gone, go away, goodbye. 
get link result. Okay, don't know what that is, but it's definitely not something that is built in this code anymore either. Alright, link. Do I still have old code referring to links? Link. That looks like, other than that, it was all gone. Okay. So, that means I have to document these. And over here, auto, auto indent. I probably want to clean this up so that it's easier to customize the auto indentation for you. There's now 500 lines of auto indentation code stored over here. Someday I will um, enable um, meta compiling on the um, helpers in the customization code so that I can document all the helpers that make things possible like this auto indent file. Um, So I'll just leave that documentation there and written so that it's good to go. Um, I do want to visit the, um, the types auto indent flags. Uh, okay, so this does not in any way refer to the function, which is good because I just changed the function. So now all users will have to do is backspace app arrow whenever they get the error and that will otherwise work exactly the same as it did before and now they have all the code that does it which is kinda cool alright so one thing I do want to do um, uh, is offer a version of this where you can pass in your own partition too though you don't have to use the global partition here and then I'll just make um, another version here that has the same interface as the original um, and that uses the global partition right there awesome All right, what time is it? Yeah, I think that's enough streaming for one day. That's pretty. That's a pretty long stream, three hours. Kind of my typical length these days. Um, so yeah, auto indent is now implemented in the custom side, and there's one other uh, token-based feature that I can move to the custom side, um, uh, so that uh, we can eliminate. Um, more um, um, another function out of the uh, a uh, API. So let me look at what that is. Also, I want to look at um, types. H. Have I finished getting rid of all of the command IDs that I can um, save and reopen? I could still, in theory re-implement on custom side. Undo redo will be the next one that I do here is adding undo redo and re I'm going to redo the undo system. I'm going to redo the history system and then I'm going to expose them to the customization kind of like I'm doing with the Lexer and 4010. I'm going to uh, um, do the same idea with 4011 is sort of uh, upgrade that system and expose the internals so I can eliminate those for next time um, but it looks like everything else here relies on GUI um, these three I could re-implement I'm just not going to yet um, uh, because they're kind of related to these ones so I want to keep them in the same area together and these ones which just rely on having control of the GUI too basically. Um, so yeah, alright. Um, let's see. Da, 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 we fixed 
um, tokens in the custom API, auto indent on the custom side, uh, token seeking on custom side. Um, let's see. Not wacky. Killing compilation is a bug. Control over how mouse affects panel focus. Less text file, user file, bar string. Mouse down, up distinction. Hook on exit, read only files. Occasionally missing the exclamation point marker. Don't execute frames on events dealing with. Ah! We've done that. Um, case insensitive interactive switch option to hide the scroll tab to view fails to sh file occurs to Nash scroll down on compilation um, uh, for drawing compilation okay so let's see where am I full s yeah full screen option exit command yeah, this is all stuff that I already did get this thing ready to ship so this can join that group down there. So this is the rest of the list of things I have to do before I'm ready to ship. The The next hardest one will be this one here. Um, after that these are all minor features that uh, will all take half a day each maybe. Um, Two, three, four, maybe less for some of them. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. All right, so eighteen. If you can count that one, nineteen things that need to be done before I can ship. <sighs> Plus, I really do need to add another one to make this twenty, which is that I need to, and I need to do this kind of under here actually. Right, uh, um, clean up and comment the auto indent code to allow for customizations. If I do that, that might allow me to add, I have another one I need to add, um, built-in option, more built-in options for auto indenting. All right, so 21 items I got to get done. Plus I need to write the docs for that, which I won't add to the to-do list, but I got to do that too. So there's a lot of, there, there's still a lot of things I got to get done, but hopefully it'll get done soon. <sighs> I keep adding stuff to this list cuz I want I want to make sure I keep shipping good ones um where everything makes sense in 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 the version that I put out. Anyway, I think that's it. That's the whole stream. Ratchet Freak, um, what about my code formatting? No, the stuff that I was talking about with like the code presentation and the auto like formatting is not coming yet. That's going to be a little later. Right now I'm trying to take the current floor coder without changing it too much and just get this sort of architecture just right um, so that it is uh, flexible enough to handle lots of cool stuff like that in the future. Right now basically what I'm doing is give, implementing small versions and small conveniences here and there by sort of making up for the technical debt that I made by over the last sort of, I would say in the beginning part of this year I finished out four coder to make it usable for a bunch of people. Um, that happened for a lot of reasons. Um, the number of people who were using it was rising really quickly for a few months. Um, Casey started using it um, uh, about halfway through that period. Um, so I wanted to make sure Handmade Hero had all the features it needed and so on. So I crammed a lot of stuff in 
And now I'm kind of uh, going back and re-architecting stuff and adding small features. But things like um, code formatting, uh, yeah, like the automatic line wrapping will be a sort of a feature, a big feature change because uh, uh, the way I want to do it is going to be fancier than what uh, other people wouldn't. You know, I mean, the obvious thing you could do is just say like, uh, if it bre reaches a certain point, wrap. And I do have like character level wrapping, um, but doing wrapping at any level above that will require me to uh, improve the buffer architecture, which is what I'm going to do next once the API is totally settled. Um, I'm going to switch over to a new gap buffer. Um, and uh, then I'm going to like add in all kinds of options so that you can do like arbitrary amounts of highlighting, uh, arbitrary numbers of cursors, arbitrary numbers of marks if you want them, and control the view position based on anything you want. Uh, once that is all available, and arbitrary like uh, there's a bug right now. Let me put it. Let me explain this. So. Say I like copy and paste, right? There's the paste fade. Well, suppose I copy this and I paste it right here. Um, oh, that doesn't have the bug because I didn't copy. Okay, so suppose I take these lines here and I paste them right here. If you're watching, it's maybe hard to see, but the little the words after it turn blue too. And the reason for that is I exp I, I specify the range that needs to be fading. But then, right afterwards, I delete a bunch of spaces out of that range when I auto indent those um, after the paste. Right? I have it paste auto indent, so you always paste the right position. Well, uh, because I just delete those spaces, it you know the range now crosses over into this text, which it's not supposed to do. So I need to make all of that sort of underlying system that deals with the positions of cursors and ranges inside the buffer and keeps them correct as you edit it. Um, and then I will be able to do smarter things like ghosting text in and drawing things in ways that doesn't quite line up with the way the text is actually set up. But I need to start adding more layers of separation between the, the format of the text and the display of the text, which right now those layers of separation are actually pretty thin. So that'll be the 4.1 series of things I'm going to do is I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to have the API basically ready the way I want it at the beginning of 4.1, but it's not going to have the features I want because I need to start adding those abstraction layers. Anyway, i um, happy to talk to you guys about this more some other time, but I'm going to sign off for now. Thanks for watching, and see you later. Bye-bye.